Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Catherine Moore McCallan, and I'm the director of the Center for Latin American Arts at UTRGV. It has been my honor to direct this exhibition, Uncovered Spaces, at the IMAS in McAllen that is directed by myself and my Center for Latin American Arts team and curated by Rahale Filsufi, one of our former colleagues at UTRGV, who is now a professor at Vanderbilt University. And Uncovered Spaces is an exhibition of women and LGBTQ artists that focuses on um, um, creating connections between the creative process, feminine solidarity, diversity, and a shared knowledge while creating a model for a community <laughs> arts exhibition and arts project here in South Texas. And we are honored to have this show up through July 10th. So if you have not been to the exhibition yet, please join us and we would be excited to see you at the IMAS Museum. Today we have Maria Fernanda Barrero, who is uh, giving her lecture today as an artist talk. Uh, Marifer is a Mexican artist who lives and works in Monterrey, Mexico. And her work is characterized by the use of paper, thread, 3D printing, as well as other works across monochrome spaces that explore elements of nature and landscape. Marifer graduated uh, with a Master of Fine Arts in Sculpture from the Slade School of Fine Arts at the University College in London in 2008. She also holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Universidad de Monterrey in Mexico, which she received in 2003. She studied sculpture in uh, Germany in, from 2005 and um, also studied at the Westing College in England in 2005. And her solo exhibitions include Starry Lines and Mountain Nights at the Bicance Gallery in Miami from 2020, By the End of Dusk, Alternativa Once Gallery in Monterrey from 2018, A House in the Air at Casa de la Cultura de Nuevo León, Monterrey from 2014, and The Flowers of a Garden that Might Have Existed at the Galeria Con Arte in Monterrey in 2012. She also participated in the Registro Cero Cinco group exhibition at the Museo de Arte Contemporáneo called Marco in Monterrey in 2018. And uh, we are gonna be talking about that a little bit today uh, in, our, in our discussion section of this um, event. And uh, without further ado, I wanted to welcome Marifer Barrero today to speak about her art practice and her artworks in the show, Uncovered Spaces. Welcome, Marifer. Hi, hello. Good afternoon. Hi, Catherine. Thank you all for joining to this talk. And many thanks to the IMAS and the Center of Latin American Arts, the University of Texas, and Catherine and Rahele and all, all your team for inviting me to this talk and for inviting me to the Uncovered Spaces exhibition. I feel like really honored, really happy to be here. And so I'll do a, like a brief introduction to, to my work in Uncovered Spaces first and then to my main projects. And then we can talk more about uh, techniques and process and, and this specific project that's shown here. I've been working on sculpture since I'm 18, so it's been a long time now. And then we can go next. We can... These are the pieces I'm showing for Uncovered Spaces. It's two, two paintings, two yarn paintings, and then a smaller yarn painting that you can see down below, and then a, a 3D printed sculpture installation piece. And that are shown here. These all belong to the Imaginary Line project, which is a project that researches the idea of the horizon and how we how we relate to it. So next, these are the two first pieces. There are two cloudscapes and they're yarn painting. And then next is a smaller piece with a seascape and a 3D printed sculpture. I'll, I'll explain the techniques later on but I just wanted you to have a reference of my work within the exhibition. And so next, as a um, brief introduction to my study practice, I was uh, mainly working in, in installation or like big format um, 
sculpture. And this was um, my main project, it's called Paper Environments. And it was about researching whiteness and monochromy as a means of unifying or integrating all of our surroundings into a whole perceptual single thing. So this first installation piece was a small paper house. And I was very intrigued as how people related within it and how a large amount of paper changed the qualities of color and light. And then for next, I, for my uh, MFA degree exam, I developed this larger, more detailed piece. It was a bedroom with all, all, all the objects a normal bedroom would probably include, like furniture or plants or a telephone, a lamp, a chair. And it was all done with paper and, no, uh, and different types of glues, but no other structural material. And so it was very interesting to see how color and uh, paper uh, and light worked on, 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 on ourselves and on space. Next. And then after the bedroom, I was really interested in, in this bluish color and all the, the perceptual experience. So I started building um, several paper gardens. And this was the first one for an art fair in London in two, 2009. And then came a bigger garden next. This was a, a whole gallery, it was Alternativa Once. I worked with them for, for many years. And then there was two rooms. And you can see here how um, the, the light is sort of pinkish, um, whitish and that, that what had to do a lot with the lead lighting and then next we can see here i think a diagram of the whole installation and people could walk through and stay there for some time it was really really relaxing really soothing on the body being in a monochrome environment and then okay, next and then here you can see how if, if we would turn lights off everything would turn more like purplish. And it was just that had to do with the light of a sunny day. And next, then we go to the next image. We can see everything changes a lot, but it only changed uh, with the weather. It was a rainy day. So we started getting this sort of cyan uh, colors in the, in the room. And so all this uh, experience with light and color and the bluish tones in paper, took me to be interested a lot in, in blue and what would happen with blue monochromies. Next. Oh, and then just, this is a brief example of other pieces I worked on. They were smaller paper collages that were like puncture paper or cutouts. And I was also researching into like concepts of, of related to nature or the ocean or like life within, within the cosmos. Next. And so I'll read you a little bit more about uh, my, 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 art, my artist statement. Uh, so basically my art practice observes and researches our beautiful biosphere. And my, my aim to investigate how we exist within our life network and how we are interconnected elements of it. Life in my work is understood as a web of relationships and experiences in contained space. I have always been marveled by our beautiful biosphere, a complex synchronized mm. life network where everything is interconnected and is exquisitely woven. My sense and wish of belonging to our biosphere right. and cosmos has led my practice. So all these paper projects led me to, to work, um, to be more and more interested in blue and the qualities of blue as light, as an environment, as a monochrome atmosphere. And then I was also working a lot by the ocean. So I think both of the, of, of the ideas of the ocean and blue just started to build up on me. And, and then, so my next project has a lot to do with blue. And in 2013, I was invited to participate in the Artesano Biennale. It's by the National Craft Museum in Mexico City. It's normally known as MAP. 
the Museo de Artes Populares, and they have a very interesting project where, where they set up a, a contemporary artist with a traditional craftsman or woman, and th they were supposed to collaborate. So I was given this opportunity to, to find someone to work with, and I've always been very interested in the Wisharika culture. So it was like my big opportunity to, to, to get to know more about the Wisharika culture. So, so I was like, with the help of uh, the Wichol Foundation in, in Sayulita and Nayarit, they, they helped me find someone to work with. And I was very lucky to find Santos Hernandez. You can see him here in the picture. He is a yarn painter. He is the son and the grandson of grand painters. And he's just an amazing ambassador for his culture and his people. And he's incredibly welcoming. Sometimes because um, lots of uh, indigenous groups in Mexico have been very, um, they've not been very well treated, of course. So they're not very welcoming towards Westerners. But Santos is very open and he was super welcoming and, and super embracing. And so he, he's, he taught me a lot about his culture, their language and, and everything they do like on a daily basis and how everything is perceived very differently for them. Um, so I feel like really lucky and very honored to have this, uh, his friendship and to be able to, to learn from him. Uh, so this picture over here, we were on our fourth pil pilgrimage to Alta Vista Sanctuary and he's a big devout of the sanctuary. So he invited us to, to take an offering to, to the goddess Niwetzika, which is their mother earth, or the equivalent to the Virgen de Guadalupe in Mexico. So that's why there's like a picture of, a, of an offering in, in the image. So just like as a, as a really brief overview, Wixarica people in Mexico, they're mostly known as Huicholes, but the, 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 the name they like is Wixarica. They are a very unique ethnic group and they live uh, mostly in the main central Pacific coast of Mexico, sort of near the Puerto Vallarta or Nayarit area and in central North Mexico. They are very intense pilgrims. So they travel a lot between their sanctuaries and their communities. And their first um, sanctuary is in Nayarit, which, which is Alta Vista, the one you saw here. And then their last sanctuary is in the mountains just by my city in Monterrey where I live. So there's like a very strange, uh, interesting connection between um, the Puerto Vallarta area and the Monterrey area as a line of sanct uh, Wixarica sanctuaries. And, and their beliefs and their culture is very rooted in mother nature and the care for mother nature. And they have developed a very, very diverse and complex mythology, very, very colorful, where the goddess of nature and the gods of corn and fire and peyote are the main characters. And most of their knowledge is obtained directly from who they call Don Peyotito or, or Abuelo Peyote. But they um, obtain this knowledge individually as a personal thing. Their, their traditions advise them against sharing knowledge through the written or the spoken word. So this made them become really, really uh, good artists because art is a, a wonderful tool for sharing knowledge without actually explaining too much. Uh, so they developed into wonderful artists and craftspeople and musicians, and even a bit of poetry, but very, very, uh, abstract and they're most known for their beadwork and also their thread work although the thread work or the uh, also known as yarn painting is not as common uh, or as famous internationally as the beadwork so I had the wonderful opportunity to learn this technique directly from Santos and um, and so we started working and for this this biennale um, we, we developed, we started building uh, an, uh, an altar for Mother Earth. She's called Niwetzika. So what I wanted to do was something that felt very loose and very free for Santos and that could also integrate within a contemporary art language. So he was doing a painting and he had all the freedom to choose what painting he needed. 
And then I could just sort of add on or try to adapt to what he was doing. And so, and there's of course lots of trash by the beach in the Pacific. Um, uh, I was in Sayulita, Nayarit. Uh, so I start, we started recollecting objects from the beach there. And Santos and I started going through them and we decided to transform some of these objects into ritual objects. So we could uh, build on this altar. And so that's why you can see like a, a can and a piece of a sh 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 sole. Uh, there's like a, a big old pan and a stick. So they are all like a ritual objects. So we developed this tiny altar. And then, so we worked on that for over a month and then we went uh, to uh, Mexico City to, to the Biennale. And then after that, we, we kept on working on our own projects, but we remained really good friends. Perfect. So here's just an example. So you can see a Santos um, painting with more detail. It's a very, very traditional piece. You can see uh, in the center, you can see the Niwetsika. She's the uh, mother earth goddess. And then you can see uh, the both the red deer and the uh, blue deer. They represent uh, yellow corn and blue corn. And so they have like all this tradition based on colors and every single animal has uh, a meaning and a story. And then you have lots of like sea animals and feathers and stuff. So they have like this very symbolic, very complex um, mythology, with, which is like really, really beautiful, really detailed. And then you can see over here, Santos Hans, he's doing yarn painting on a skull. And now he it was very interesting uh, for us to, to live through this process because after working together, um, he went on and worked with a gallery with a lady from New York, New York City in Sayulita. So he, he also moved on to like more contemporary type of um, yarn painting. And he's been working there for years. And he's had like a really good experience and he's been able to like do a like a really good earning with his technique. So he's, he's been really happy. So if you want to look for, for Santos Gallery, the, the one he works with, you can look for it as Evoke the, the Spirit. In, in on Instagram. Okay, so this is this is more my project. Uh, after after a while, I um I started to work on on a project for Marco, for Marco Museum. But then before this, I I just wanted to explain a little bit about. I think I missed explaining about about the wax. In the image before, you could see. Could we go back one slide? Sorry. Thank you because you can see the wax here and how um, Santos is sticking the, the yarn to, to the wax. And the wax, uh, Santos makes his own wax by mixing two types of beeswax, one that's more, more brittle and one that is softer. And he only gets them in like very specific, specific small villages in, in, the, in the mountains in Nayarit. So he's the only one that has the formula for, for the wax. And, um, and after applying the wax to the surface, he will punch into like the, with the yarn into the wax and he'll start drawing with the yarn. And then he will fill up those, those spaces or there's those little sections with more yarn. So that's how he works. He works with a really beautiful feather. I work with scissors, but he works with really nice instruments. Okay, perfect. Next, now we can go into the onto the Marco project. So in 2017, uh, Marco was organizing this exhibition about like the sort of like very representative artists in my city. And they invited me to Registro 05. Um, and I, I, for this exhibition, I proposed a project called An Imaginary Line, which researches the idea of the horizon as a relationship between human, the human being and our immense biosphere. This image shown here is from my pieces at Marco. The first one is a 3D router cut topographical image of the mountains in the Monterrey area, which obviously, by the way, they include the sanctuary, the Wichol sanctuary. Um, within these mountains. And then in the back, you can see there's um, some um, 
paintings, there are yarn paintings. So there, there were three very uh, long, very panoramic yarn paintings. And the idea more, that, more than going into the yarn detail was of creating this sort of uh, ocean landscape that was very panoramic and it was very immersive, especially with the dark light. So it was more like an install, although they're paintings, it was more, more like an installation piece. So after Marco's exhibition, I kept on working with, uh, with this project and I started developing more and more complex images. And you can see a close up here of this piece that was a private commission. And it was done with uh, like more detail, more detail into thread and into um, sort of more organic shapes. So you can see here, there's a very special texture, like a spiraling, very organic texture that naturally develops when you start filling up sections of thread. And, and this for me resembles, or, or it makes me think a lot in the flow and the complex geometries of, of many natural phenomena like, like clouds or ocean currents. And this is another example of the texture and the geometries the thread develops depending how you lay it out. And so going on to my, more to my creative process and the technique, um, I've had lots of questions about it. I, I see yarn painting and in general uh, techniques as research and perceptual tools, more like vehicles of communication. That's why I've used a lot of um, different techniques throughout my practice and a very wide um, uh, range of them. So yarn painting is a beautiful and very flowing and very contemplative technique. It is quite simple in principle, but it, but it is very intensive and it requires a very precise handwork. So these are some examples of color samples and color sa palettes and how I, I would mix them. I normally work with mercerized embroidery thread, which is very brightly colored and it's very soft and it's very shiny. So it has a very nice um, look in the end. And then you have to do like lots of color testing and blending and deciding a palette. And then when, when I choose the color palette and then I have an, the image I want to, to build, I will transform this image into, into a sort of like painting by number format, like the ones um, children use in schools, which is like a very simple, simplified way of uh, approaching to, to complex images. And then we, uh, I'll have numbers assigned to each color and I'll, I'll, I'll draw the, I'll do the drawing, I'll do it by number and then we'll start, I'll start doing the outline of the shape and with thread. And I use a very pointy, very pointy sharp scissors to, to push the thread into the wax following the, the drawing. And then when all the outlines are um, established, then I'll start filling up by color. You can see how, how the shapes and the spirals start developing on their own here in the images. And so this is the last piece I'm working on. So slowly and slowly, but then you start building up and building up uh, sections of thread and uh, um, uh, a piece will start showing, an image will start showing up. So now I'll move on to the other part of the of the project, an imaginary line. Um, it, it's, it has more to do with uh, like sort of new technologies or 3D printing and data processing. Uh, but I, for me, they're still the same project. They're still related. They still have to do with this idea of the horizon. Um, so it's actually the process is quite simple. It's very open source. I basically went on, on online on Google um, and, I print, and I looked for how to print a mountain. So it's something anyone can do if, if you sort of read through it. And there are several open source databases with topographical maps uh, that you can download for free. And then you start sort of selecting the geographical area that you are interested in. And, and that data has to be, those maps have to be processed and edited until they're compatible enough with your 3D printer. Um, 
and then well basically you print your mountain and for me this is like a very incredible process because i through all these open source technologies and like a common person is able to access like satellite information or topographical information that before was very hard to reach and then so this was the first uh, 3d printed piece and then this is the piece um, we're showing in uncovered spaces exhibition it's basically a line a selected line a horizontal very straight long line selected from maps from the, um, the mountains in my city so it was just as long as long as it could go and as long as it could be printed and um, can we see the next image so we can see more like process so these are just samples of the of the cuts and the selection of the topographical data and then that was edited and uh, divided and printed and then put back together into one single line. Thank you. Next. So wrapping up and, and pulling all together, uh, either with yarn paper or, um, I mean, either with paper or yarn painting or 3D printing, the basic aim of my work remains I strive to find aesthetic and perceptive tools that help us remember and experience ourselves, ourselves in our skin, in our bones, and in our, in our mind, that we are living and interconnected organisms within our biosphere. We are not isolated and we are not alone. The, the horizon's imaginary line is not only a tracing through light, through landscape, it is also an ellipse around us. It is everything around us. So Chris Hatfield um, has this very beautiful phrase. He's, he described our atmosphere. By the way, Chris Hatfield is uh, one of the main astronauts in the International Space Station. Uh, he described our atmosphere as a thin blue line, as everything, it contains everything that, it, that is important for us. It contains life. And so Hatfield's comment has been very important to me personally because it led me to observe the horizon as under a wider perspective, more like the web of life being reflected in the geometry of the whole planet, in the geometry of mountains, in the tones of light at dawn, in the blues of dusk and dawn, in the spirals of clouds and the patterns of ocean currents. So threads and prints here, for me, they became perceptual vehicles they make visible our life network and they make tangible the marvelous fabric of life that we inhabit. So that's, I think that's all for today. Thank you very much for, for listening. Maybe we can go on to, to questions or comments. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Marifer. What a beautiful presentation. I would like to um, open up the discussions uh, for and welcome any questions that anyone uh, might have. And also um, one question is uh, that's in the chat right now. If you do wanna ask a question, you can raise your hand in the, in the Zoom uh, and we'll, we'll call on you. And one question that's in the chat now is from our Executive Director of the IMS and Fortescue. She wanted to know about your process with applying wax for your yarn paintings. And she was wondering, do you apply the wax incrementally to each um, embroidery thread or is the wax applied all at once? And then how do you seal or fix the thread so that um, the wax doesn't melt in the heat or in the elements? Okay, yeah. Um, the wax, um, we have, well, first of all, Santos does the wax mix. I am not like, I don't have a formula and I've always asked him to keep the formula to himself. Um, so he, he gets this very, he goes to this very small towns in Nayarit and he will get two different types of waxes. One wax will make the uh, mixture soft and one, and the other one will make it brittle. So he mixes them in the right proportion for the wax to be sticky enough, but brittle enough. 
so it doesn't fall off. And then uh, once you have the wax, you will just heat it a bit with your hand or a little bit in the stove. And then you can apply it to a surface, to any surface. It can be even a 3D surface. And so I normally apply it to a panel of wood with a spatula and until it goes really thin and really soft. That's the yellow thing that you can see in the images. So, so, so once the wax is, is dry, which takes like a very short time, then, then you take the thread and you sort of push the thread into the, um, into the wax surface and it will stick and it will stay there if you push enough. You have to be careful enough so you don't like scratch the wax and then, or like uh, mess up your thread and let it fall on the wax so it gets dirty. But if you keep your thread clean and you just sort of push it in place, then it will stay there. And this is um, like the qualities this wax has are very, very special. There's no, I was telling Catherine one day, there's no other glue. Like it doesn't matter how like new, how, how expensive or acid free it is. There's no other glue that will do this same job. So this, I think the wax is what makes also the, this technique very special. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I also had a question from Rahale Phil Sufi, our, our curator of the exhibition. Uh, she had a question about uh, how you address space. And um, I'm going to go ahead and, and put the, the image of your pieces up again um, on, on share screen so mm -hmm. that uh, you can see your artwork because I think it's really important to think about how your artwork is um, interacting with the rest of the pieces in Uncovered Spaces. And Rahale's question was related to this. She said, uh, I'm, I'm interested in, apart from the excellent craftsmanship and elegance and beauty of your work, how your artworks engage with the open space of the gallery and the interaction of old techniques, more traditional concepts of painting and sculpture conflated with newer media such as 3D printing and also ancient techniques of um, the yarn and wax application that's uh, based on the, the Wixarika traditions. Um, can you talk about how that your work engages with the actual space of the gallery and is in a sort of dialogue with the other works of art in the Uncovered Spaces exhibition as well? Sure, yeah. I think my like my nature as an artist is very three-dimensional. Like, like even if yarn painting is very flat or it's very, it's normally understood as a 2D work, the, uh, my background is very strong in sculpture and installations, so they st still behave as 3D pieces um, and they have like all this um, texture into the yarn. So for me, they're not, they're, they don't seem so flat and, and the way you create them is very two dimensional, whereas like compared with traditional painting is goes really flat and this yarn paint I mean yarn has a volume even if, if it turns out flat or like embroidery it will still have a volume so that sort of pulls it out into into space of, of the gallery for me and um, I think also it has a lot to do with, with color and like a, lots of uh, colors like in very in a very narrow palette like say lots of blues or lots of grays and monochromy tends to, to sort of embrace you or surround you. So for me, uh, like my main tool uh, to approach space is a color or like light and mon through monochromy. And it's, I think it's just so strong and so, monochromy is so different from, from what we're normally um, used to. I mean, in terms of perception, that that it changes the way we approach space too and then sort of you are able to engage with the uh, visitor more or the the, uh, the yeah the, the the person that's sort of navigating through the gallery is more captivated by the color 
Interesting. Thank you so much. Yes, I feel like colors, the bold colors of many of the artworks are in this incredible dialogue with each other in this exhibition, Uncovered Spaces. And I feel like too, the, the marvelous fabric of life that we all inhabit and the interconnected nature that you that you talk about with your art is is so important for the theme of uncovered spaces as an exhibition of women and LGBTQ artists that is articulating ideas related to cultural expectations and social norms and also encouraging the celebration of diversity and inclusion, a, a topic that's very important right now, of course, during Pride Month. And uh, so I feel like this is all so relevant for, for the discussions. And I also wanted to invite um, one individual in our, in our um, Zoom meeting right now, Emedeth Herrera Valdez. She is a curator based out of New York uh, who has her MA from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU. She's from Saltillo. Coahuila, and um, she currently works at Ruth Hardinger's studio in New York as an archivist and um, a scholar. And she's also been an art educator at the Hispanic Society of America in New York, and has also worked at the Whitney Museum and the Institute of Fine Arts. So Emmedeth, I wanted to welcome you today. And Emmedeth flew down from New York a few weeks ago to see Uncovered Spaces and experience the exhibition. And I just wanted to invite you to ask a question or uh, make a comment if you would like to. Sure, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to see your lecture, Marifer, moderated by you, Catherine. It's always delightful. And just when I was looking at your lecture, listening to it, like, appreciating all your work that I know for years. I was just remembering how exquisite and detailed the volumes are, even from the time that you were working with monochromy and paper, they will always pop out and like invite the viewer to just go into them and kind of walk around the volumes and discover all this nature. And it is very interesting to see how now that you are including these colors through thread. Um, I just found fascinating, for example, a boy that was talking to the mom when I was there at the museum. And um, he was just like wondering, where is the wax in this work? You know, at first they were so interested and fascinated by the, the shiny of the thread. But then at the end, he was like, looking closely and he was so interested in knowing how you were integrating the wax and probably wondering if his mom was able to do it like well this is a women's exhibition can you do this now so I, I just wanted to ask you Marifer how you feel these kind of um, interactions make an impact in your work, in the reading, and probably catering if you had more experiences like this when you were giving all these tours to kids and adults and everything. Um, thank you, Emirith. I'm like, like very captivated by, by, your, by your question. I think um, in terms of the audience and children, I've always been very interested in sort of including everyone. Like something for me that's very hard from contemporary art is when it gets like super specialized and super difficult or very, very conceptual and it's not accessible to anyone. So one thing I liked a lot about monochromy and um, installation work is that it's very accessible to everyone because it's, it's a lot about uh, ex bodily experiences and, and perception. So anybody that's physically present or e even anybody that's able to just to s see with their eyes will be able to interact with the piece and we'll, we will be able to somehow communicate at different levels maybe. But, but it's, it was very interesting. So I've always been sort of captivated by by children uh, as an audience. 
and and I I just love them if they if they can get involved. It happened a lot with the paper installations. Those were very accessible for children, and they liked them a lot. I've noticed in in the galleries when we give tours to the students and um, our high school students from PSJA and Edinburgh Independent School District and McAllen School District, how how students are are so drawn to your pieces, uh, Marifer. They're so interested in the technique, but also this idea of landscapes and this idea of our our making making art accessible to all and also thinking about where we are in the world and living along the the US Mexico border we live in such a an international place with uh, diverse cultures coming together and um, I feel I feel like the landscapes in your in your pieces also speak very powerfully to audiences thinking about horizons thinking about uh, borders and boundaries. And one of the goals of Uncovered Spaces is to uncover these places of vulnerability and create a, more of a, a spirit of inclusion and welcoming of all voices. So it's really exciting to hear your talk today, how, how connecting with, with other groups and connecting with other artists and your research with the Wisharika artist has has really inspired your work so we're excited to to share that knowledge when we have more field trips later this week with UTRGV students and also students from the Edinburgh School District and San Isidro School Districts. Um, we had one more other question related to to this idea of horizons. Um, Amelia was asking what draws you to certain mountain ranges and can you speak a little bit more about how the mountain range in Uncovered Spaces communicates your identity? Well, um, I live, um, I think the, the um, setting, the landscape setting in Monterrey is very different here than the one you have in, in McAllen and Texas and all like the Rio Grande Valley area. We have very, very particular and very special mountains in Monterrey. It's the sort of like the beginning or like the end of a very of a long mountainous range that goes all through through America and the way mountains sort of close up or maybe open up here is very special maybe maybe you could like look for them online because they're no not well known but like I live in front of one of the main mountains and it's like a it's like a, a wall or it's like a mountain door or something like very strange um way of like being a mountain and so i think all these particular shapes and being surrounded for like long periods of my life with mountains it has had like a big impact in myself and it's a funny thing because it doesn't seem that the city itself gives so too much value to the mountains. We just like people just assume there it's normal to have these mountains, but they're very uncommon. And and Mexico is actually a very mountainous uh, uh, country. So so I think it just makes you think differently if you live in the mountains. It it, it builds up your your identity somehow. And landscape for me is a very easy, a very approachable way to connect to nature or to connect to like big, huge cosmological things because they're so big, but they're so close. So, so that's why they're like so, so important for me. And then in the Nayarit area, there's also, there's a different mountain range. And it's also very important for, for, the, for the Wisharika people. And most of their sanctuaries are embedded somehow like in very um, complex um, places within the jungle or the forest inside the mountains or even the desert, but they're still in the mountains. I think I miss, I am missing a part of the question, right? There was another question included there. I think that was a wonderful answer. No, I think you answered it well. We have another question from Carlos Limas, um, and this is a very interesting question about collaborations, which I was also hoping you could talk about. Um, 
Um, Carlos's question was, um, how do you think having this experience with traditional techniques and ceremonies when connecting with the Wisharika culture has changed you as a contemporary artist? Okay, yeah. That's an interesting question. I, I don't know what came first. My, my mom, she, she, she's a historian. Um, and so, and she was a, an anthropology student. So since we were kids, she talked a lot about um, ethnic groups and um, people that just worked with um, very ancient or very traditional or at least non-Western uh, cultures. So I was always very interested how many um, non-Western cultures are very deeply uh, rooted in nature and they're, they're very sustainable and they're very harmonious with, with Mother Earth. And whereas uh, Western cultures, um, we, we many times we just forget that we live within a planet that is also alive and that also needs to be taken care of. So I think that idea of being close to non-Western cultures has always been very present in, in my life or in my upbringing somehow. And then, um, so when I had this opportunity, and I considered studying um, anthropology for a long time, but then so, sort of somehow like art just showed up and it was very strong and very powerful and very magnetic. So, so I decided to, to do my, my major in art and my MFA. So I've always been sort of very close to anthropology-based studies. And so when I had the chance to work with um, with someone that was like really from the Wisharika culture and like really authentic. So I just took took the opportunity. I think I would have looked for it in some other ways if I had had to. But then this was just the best opportunity and being being sort of so close to them because I felt really honored and it felt very special that he would allow us to join them because they're normally very they're very protective of their families and of their traditions and they normally they don't for example they don't like to share images or pictures of their families of their clothes or of their rituals so many times that I went with Santos I, I wish I could film the experience or even take a, a simple picture but I know that I knew they didn't they didn't they just don't like it they are quite against uh, cameras so so I only have like two or three pictures that Santos was um, agreeing to and so it's just been I think it's been a very deep and transforming experience it's just made made my experience wider being able to to work with him from like being so close to him and whereas from the books it's all it's always not not as as intense or as real yeah that's a that's a great point and i was also wanted to ask about about how how connecting with santos and and having this experience to to learn about this technique of creating yarn paintings and um creating these incredible works of art um in the contemporary art galleries how does that help you uh, or help us to rethink rethink traditional uh, traditional canonical um ideas about art media and uh, how do how, how does this help us transcend traditional media by creating these new these new medium of uh, yarn paintings or three D printed artworks and and how can how can that help us to to like rethink boundaries in our artistic practice and also in in understanding and appreciating contemporary art that that does acknowledge these indigenous cultures that are so important in your in your artistic practice and, and experience yeah well um i think it has to do with they like most western cultures and in particular like from my own experience in particular santos they don't see art as a, a thing on its own 
or a thing that's apart everything else or a thing that's in a museum or like in a collection. Art is a tool, it's a vehicle of, of communicating, of um, acquiring knowledge, of sharing knowledge. So it's just a way, like a language. And that's sort of like completely integrated within their like daily life, their daily rituals, or all, all their pilgrimage. Everything is sort of one single thing. And everything is sort of part of the same idea or the same wish to sort of take care of Mother Earth and do their do all their pilgrimages and do all their rituals and and do all of their activities are sort of sacred and they're all sort of serving the same uh, objective that's taking care of life, I suppose. Uh, I mean, I, I, I've i seen that. So I think that's very valuable for us to understand contemporary art, not as an isolated thing that's sort of very specialized and that you need to study a lot to be able to understand it, but that art can be something that's everywhere and in everything that we that we live and then we experience and that we do it's not a separate a separate thing on its own well thank you so much marifa this has been an incredible artist talk we hope everyone in the audience has enjoyed this we want to congratulate you on your pieces in the exhibition thank and you. and thank you for being a part of uncovered spaces in mccallan Thank you very much for, for having me and my work and, and this talk too. You're so welcome and, and the honor's all ours. And we hope that everyone who has not had a moment to, to see Uncovered Spaces, or if you wanna go see it again, please please come to the IMAS to enjoy Uncovered Spaces and viewing Maria Fernanda Barrero's art in the galleries. And we thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you.